Bottom line, up front. White House staff and GOP elite diagnosed COVID positive. President Trump hospitalized but returned to the White House with uncertain health status. A quad alliance of the United States, Australia, India, and Japan plans to cut China out of the long-term supply chain for electronics. Texas legal shakeup. U.S. Attorney for the District of West Texas, John Bash, resigns. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton recommended for criminal charges. And the visa revoked. For Andrei Teloshenko, Ukrainian linked to the GOP conspiracy with Russia to attack the 2020 election. I'm Eric Garland. After 20 years delivering intelligence to world leaders, a mobster owned by Russia took the White House, and I started giving daily intelligence briefs directly to the people. This is Game Theory Today, your source for global events, clear analysis, and appropriate profanity. Guys, it's time for some Game Theory. The general mood, frenetic chaos, awful intensity, global realignment, and Joe Biden's dogs. All of those elements, probably in that order, define America right now. The question, who is president right now? Who is in control of the awesome power of the American state is a terrible one and one that has only been asked for the briefest of moments in modern history. During the maelstrom of September 11th, it was, for a brief time, not clear where President George W. Bush was heading, when he would arrive, and when he would address the nation. After Ronald Reagan's attempted assassination, Secretary of State Alexander Haig asserted, I am in control here. And yo, shout out to all the people dating themselves on Twitter by making Alexander Haig jokes the last couple days. I mean, good to know that we've survived this long. And it's middle age. Hey, we're there. Thank you, people on Twitter. But uh, before that, you'd probably have to go all the way back to Warren G. Harding's heart attack and Vice President Calvin Coolidge taking the oath of office given by his father on the family's Vermont dairy farm, Plymouth, Vermont, before there was a significant question about who was in control of the country. Even JFK's assassination left no question. Not like the one that America and the world faced this weekend. The stunts, shocks, and insanities the last few days have been the least certain America has seemed in modern memory. It seems like America is in disarray, seized by crisis, sweating out a fever dream, and just tired. I mean, anyone else? I mean, I think I know the answer to that question. It's pretty much all of us. Then again, if you lift your head out of Trump's tweets and look around the world, actually, the entire global system is in that same moment filled with threats and opportunities on a scale never experienced. We are not living through an historic moment, but historic reorientation. And we can't imagine what the world we're creating is really going to look like because we're making it collectively. Big deal. And that's when Joe Biden whips out a video about how we're really voting to put dogs back in the White House, and it all seems pretty doable. And with that... It is time for the Profanity Daily Brief. All righty. So, it would be natural to start with, I don't know, not knowing who the president is or whether anyone can work safely at the White House. But that is precisely why I want to start with a story that is critically important and sounds as boring as watching paint dry. You know, you get caught in the day's hallucinations and uh, you forget that all the propaganda and distraction from the knuckleheads is really about obscuring the larger global game of dominating <laughs> economics. And that involves some pretty dry stuff that most people are not going to pay attention to. Uh, that's what my business of competitive intelligence has been, forgetting what's in the news cycle and finding out what the future of companies uh, competing all over the world is going to be about. And then you get the national security and other stuff uh, rolled in. So it's kind of thing I look at. So this weekend, a news story broke out of the Sydney Morning Herald, not daily reading for most Yanks. It's a really big deal. I was kind of surprised it, it went kind of viral, like five, 600 tweets for a Saturday morning on something that was pretty dry, uh, but really important. So uh, Australian Foreign Minister Marisa Payne warned that the Indo-Pacific region is under, quote, unprecedented pressure as she prepared for a trip to Tokyo, which is happening now. It's supposedly where Mike Pompeo is. Uh, Payne is meeting with her counterparts in the so-called Quad Alliance of the United States, 
Australia, India, and Japan, particularly to discuss breaking China's hold on rare earth minerals in the industrial supply chain and opposing authoritarian disinformation. So get something straight. That thing could not be any more disruptive to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, you got Asia Pacific's other economic powerhouses, India, Japan, meeting with the United States to talk about dealing with the propaganda bullshit from authoritarians. So since the other four democracies will guess who that is uh, and how the other the four countries together will develop, quote, domestic critical minerals processing facilities as an alternative to sourcing those minerals from China. So you kind of tracking why I was surprised this got six or seven hundred retweets. I mean, good stuff. Spread it, guys. This is this is what matters. But, you know, as far as headlines go, it's tough. I got that. Um, so they're going, they're having this meeting in Tokyo, right, right next to China, going to be talking all sorts of shit about China. And uh, in particular, the Quad Alliance is going to be talking about plans for how to counter China, undermining democracy while the four countries try to keep their populations from dying because of the virus that China let loose. Uh, oh, and how to make sure that their Iran sanctions breaking money laundering spy telecom company, also Huawei, as it's more commonly known, can go pound sand. Uh, personally, I'm not sure that there is a possible bigger fuck you to China. I don't think it exists. Uh, you got the U.S., Australia, India, Japan countering the chi comms, lying to the world, getting its tech infrastructure in other countries, and leveraging the global mining sector that they have spent decades conquering. So one of the things I thought that was a really big deal here, let's talk about timing and why it's critical. You know, frankly, given Trump and Kushner's relationship with China... Uh, they, uh, you know, you got Trump or Ivanka's uh, owning trademarks there or owing their banks money for these big, stupid real estate projects. You would not think that the Trump administration with Pompeo still in it and all that would move this aggressively. And it's kind of like with the sanctions against certain other allies of Russia. You kind of wonder after a while if there isn't some invisible hand at play. But, you know, we can't measure that. So we'll just leave that sort of a variable in the equation. Um so it's kind of weird to see the Trump administration move on this, right? Uh, but they're not the only ones kind of surprising here. Uh, now, now, Australia being in this, that makes a lot of sense. They're like our feistiest ally right now. UK, we've got the tightest relationship, but they still have Boris Johnson. they got a whole bunch of nasty money up in their banking sector. Their political sector still got problems. Uh, Australia's got plenty of interference going on too, but man, their, their government is really taking the lead. Uh, on a lot of things, technology, this kind of geopolitical diplomatic stuff, really cool. Uh, and they are taking no crap from any foreign powers with bad intentions because, you know, they've got people bribing their members of parliament, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so the Aussies, we know where they're at. But uh, India is still under the power of the very Trumptastic Nahendra Modi. And you should Google him if you don't understand uh, quite what his game has been in India. It, just Trumptastic is my, my adjective for the guy. Um, and they're moving, which is kind of a shock. And then you got Japan's got a new prime minister, Yoshihide Suga. And, you know, he's taken over after Abe, who's been in for years. So this is a really bold move out of the gate. So why are they moving against China? And isn't there a major risk in that? Right? We're talking bajillions of dollars here. We're talking about China controls all this stuff. Pissing them off at this level could be risky, right? Well, it is. So let's analyze that. Well, this is all kinds of risk. <laughs> you know, when well, you're talking about disrupting supply chains, finance, I suppose military stuff. I mean, how much trouble do you want to start with these guys? Um, and probably of all those things, the rare earths, Part of their strategic plan that they're going to discuss over in to Tokyo is probably the most disruptive. So, you know, like, let's look at the, the you know, disinformation stuff. Uh, you know, it sounds, it's important. You got COVID-19 going on. But, you know, at the end of the day, communist regime is full of shit. More news at no kidding o'clock. I mean, they're communist regimes. That's, that's what they do. But no, 
Let's let's lead with this headline. Whoa, a disruption in the global nickel, cobalt, gallium, and barite markets. Don't talk to me about cadmium, yo. <laughs> I mean, you know, but that's what goes into making magnets, electronics, advanced fracking technology, basically the future of GDP production and innovation. So when China jumps on that sector, it's because they want their regime to control all of it. And currently, they basically do. They've been working on this for decades. Um, that's why they're in Africa. That's why they're buying stuff up in Australia. Big chunk of land there. Lots of mining. So this is their play. And we're going to take that toy away from them. So you got Japan and India is joining the Trump administration to tell China to piss off and take its propaganda about COVID with them. Oh, and get the hell out of Aussie politics. At, thanks. Close your door on the way out. So I'm trying to figure out how this is happening now because it is such a risk. So I'm surmising that these leaders must know a regime change is on the way in the United States and that the regime in China may not be an ideal partner for business in that environment, to put it mildly. The details remain speculation as to why China might be on the outs going forward. I'm going to say the thousands of economic espionage and counterintelligence cases, uh, plus the money laundering, sending all that fentanyl to, you know, through Mexico at us and whatnot, plus the plague they unleashed. I don't think that has made China too popular in the halls of power in general. So whatever plans anybody had with that regime, be they private firms or countries, that's going to need to be rethought. COVID finally rattles the GOP and the White House. Well, in the words of Donald Trump, COVID-19 is, quote, deadly stuff. It goes through the air. It's more deadly than your most strenuous flus. That's what he told Bob Woodward for the book Rage. Trump then said, just stay calm. It'll go away. And he was right the first time around. While over 200,000 souls perished in the United States, Donald Trump has led an effort to send our adversaries, our protective equipment, to downplay protective measures and to distort the reality of the fourth most deadly event in our nation's history. For reasons that defy explanation, the normally germophobic Trump has refused to wear masks and his political party, from the national to the state level, has followed suit, pressing to open schools prematurely, get bars and restaurants serving as fast as possible, just as we enter the most dangerous phase, the winter. It seemed like the Trump administration and the GOP acted like the disease couldn't touch them. But surprise, it is touching them all over. As of this recording, Trump has taken Marine One up the street to the hospital where he was in a critical state or something, but he worked the whole time and now he's back at the White House or something. Well, we go to Dr. Dina Grayson on this because basically you don't know anybody with as much expertise as Dina has on this subject right now. And for the better part of a year, she's been giving this away in videos for free, going on BBC. She, we just lucky enough to have somebody on Twitter uh, who is a, an incredible educator and communicator on on this subject, who who studied bio defense for Ebola and other things related to pandemics, and she's been helping us out here. And Dina is pretty concerned that Trump is very ill. He's on remdesivir, a retroviral used only for the very sick, hospitalized patients. Um, apparently, it's a, quite a miracle drug, um, the only one that will work when your viral load gets high enough that you need to be hospitalized. Everything else needs to be used before that, to my understanding. Uh, so that's Trump's on, uh, Regeneron, Oxygen, the steroid dexamethasone, which is normally used for the critically ill on a ventilator. And so that's the whole list. Uh, let's see, Regeneron, Oxygen, Remdesivir, Medtexamethasone, Covivi. And this is a disease that can crash suddenly when you're at that point. And here's the deal. Trump may die. 
soon, and he may not be alone. Moreover, a significant number of Trump's inner circle in the White House and on his own campaign have been diagnosed with COVID. The First Lady, his press secretary, Kelly McGinnity, campaign manager Bill Stepien, Kellyanne Conway. I have no idea what she does anymore, but apparently she still works somewhere and she's got it. A bunch of GOP senators, including senators on the Judiciary Committee, so it's not clear how they're going to get their business done. Um, a whole bunch of people present for the announcement of Amy Coney Barrett as the reanimated zombie of Antonin Scalia. So the, the whole message here is, apparently this insanely contagious disease is contagious. Uh, total mystery, right? Um, we, we were told nine months ago, this thing is incredibly contagious and something's been up where they just didn't believe it. So after months of pretending like nothing of consequence could happen to their little merry band of agents of foreign powers, something of consequence has happened right along the time frame that everybody said this is when people were going to get sick. Uh, for some of these folks, it's the last thing that might ever happen to them. So we're in an unprecedented position. The White House will not be sufficiently staffed. Trump heaving himself up, looking like he's suppressing a cough and unable to breathe on some steps. Doesn't look much up to be being president right now, physically. And the campaign won't have enough staff for the last critical month of this election. Overall, it's not really clear who runs the executive branch or who's going to run it in as many as a few hours. I don't think America's ever been through anything like this. And... That is all I have at press time. Big news out of the Lone Star State. Two of the top legal officials have had major career shifts. The U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Texas, John Bash, suddenly left the office to go into the private sector. And multiple colleagues of Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton have recommended that he be referred for criminal charges. So here's my take. I've been expecting moves like this. Uh, the Trump Hydra is bigger than just that Queens mobster and his idiot son-in-law. It also involves putting people in certain positions where they get to decide who gets indicted. So for a while, I've been expecting some of these people to suddenly disappear around the same time as Trump. And I am not disappointed. <laughs> uh, this John Bash guy is an interesting character. Apparently, he got put in charge of the investigation of who leaked the story of Mike Flynn's calls with Sergei Kislyak to the news back in late 2016. You might remember uh, guys like Devin Nunes uh, were all complaining, leaks, 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 also upset. Now, it's very interesting because several of the books uh, from the Obama administration officials are out now and they pretty much all say that the leak was a shock for them and it stands to reason that somebody possibly on the GOP side may have been the leak. Well, they sent this Bash guy to go check it out. Um, otherwise, this Bash's wife, Zena, is that lady who sat behind Brett Kavanaugh at his Senate judiciary hearing and made that assholey white power okay symbol that they do like on camera, so there's something up there. Uh, the Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson is in a lot more obvious trouble. Seven of his colleagues came together and accused him of improper influence, abuse of office, bribery, and, quote, other potential criminal offenses, which is a pretty wide range from jaywalking on up to chemical warfare. Who knows? Uh, and they sent these accusations to law enforcement, uh, these sound like federal crimes. <laughs> uh, also, Paxton is involved, I guess, in the antitrust suits against Google, something Bill Barr took a particular interest in, which, um, well, a lot going on there, so we'll see. Either way, here's my forecast. This is not the last state to get this treatment. I have a few guesses as to which may be affected. We'll see. <laughs> And our last heartwarming story, because we've got to have something about the Russians messing with our election here. Uh, the news came out today that uh, the Ukrainian Andrei Tervzhenko, who is 
buddies with Andrei Dirkach, the Russian spy from Ukraine. Uh, this Telezhenko guy got his visa revoked. Uh, those dudes were working together alongside with Giuliani to spread Russian intel propaganda, particularly to aim at Joe Biden and saying he's the real guy in Russia's pocket and that which makes a whole lot of sense because you know if you are owned by the russian mob and your buddy and personal attorney is hanging out with russian mob dudes in ukraine you should have your buddy paid by one russian mobster to get some other russian mob dudes together to start the the rumor that the other guy is really the one uh, who's influenced by the russian mob stuff or ukraine or some money it's not a really good plan there's a lot of this where you try and describe uh what's going on or what they've come up with for strategy and what they're going to do um and there's not really much to discuss and you you go through the the details in order of what they're 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 proposing or what they designed and how they've executed it and you sound stupid for describing and it's like you didn't know what the story was that you were talking about nope you're describing it accurately it's just stupid it's just dumb that's what's going on here so anyways apparently last month uh we didn't just get Dirkach, we got this telzenko guy uh and it is thought that perhaps when ron johnson was like i wasn't uh, senator ron johnson of uh wisconsin and of doing fourth of july in moscow fame said uh no i, I wasn't just i wasn't talking to Dirkach. he was probably talking to telzenko either way um, those are Giuliani's buds here. No doubt there's a connection uh, to our man Dmitry Firtash. And it's just yet one more piece of evidence of Russia messing around. Uh, in the 2020 election, though, I think many other aspects will come to the fore. But uh, maybe we could get a Giuliani indictment. It's about time. <laughs> And now it's time for Today in Criminal Doom, the segment where I read more or less randomly from the happiest website in the world, justice.gov slash USAO, the U.S. Attorney's Office's slash press releases. Big fun one today, the Western District of Tennessee, software rich guy weirdo John McAfee finally indicted for tax evasion. It was a funny one. There was a tweet because with some of these guys, there's a tweet for everything. September 25th, which was only a couple of weeks ago, uh, he had some tweet up saying, I refuse to pay taxes. Now mind your own business to somebody on, uh, on the Twitters. Well, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office did not feel that way about minding their own business. So, um, filed under seal. We got uh, John McAfee resided in Lexington, Tennessee, uh, and earned millions in dollars in income from various sources, including but not limited to, from 2014 to 2016 for speaking engagements. Uh, 2015 to 2016, the rights to his life story for a documentary. 2016 to 2018, work as a consultant. 2017 through 2018, it was a pretty short time frame for a guy like this, because he's been on the lam for a while or something. He's a professional weirdo, in addition to other things. For promoting cryptocurrencies from for just a year there. Uh, and so the, uh, the IRS didn't get its, uh, get its cut there. So you got, uh, the calendar year 2014 affirmative acts, among others, directing the payment of his income to a bank account in the name of a nominee, purchasing real property and titling and causing the titling of that property in the name of a nominee. And, uh, you got some evasion of tax by way of, uh, they got some cryptocurrencies in here. It's a yacht, because there's got to be a yacht with these guys. Um, so you're, you're talking about, um, you know, several years there uh, where you're talking about major bucks. And uh, he apparently just kept pushing that. So, um, yeah. You, well, mind your own business. Well, no, thanks. We won't. This one actually is not uh, from the U.S. Attorney's Office. It's from the Financial Crimes News because uh, there's a lot of this stuff going around uh, around the world. It's not just us here. You've got uh, India's anti-graft agency raided the premises of senior Congress leader D.K. Shivakumar and recovered around $68,400 in cash. He was arrested last year over money laundering allegations. And if we're going to keep it global here, you got Flavio Bolsonaro, the son of Brazil's president. 
uh, Jair Bolsonaro, another Trumptastic knucklehead down there of uh, all, all forms of uh, mobbed up cr- uh, crimes, mainly financial, but then running an or- organization, I think it was like a family organization with 120 members. That's a crime family, folks. I mean, generally. <laughs> That's quite a criminal organization. So we're not the only ones having fun. You got a Veterans Affairs respiratory therapist pleading guilty to stealing and selling COVID-19 respiratory supplies in the Western District of Washington. Bad form there. Um, a, a From Seattle, a respiratory therapist at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Seattle pleaded guilty in U.S. District Court to theft of government property, uh, apparently was stealing ventilators and bronchoscopes and selling for a fraction of their value uh, on eBay. There's a uh, total loss of the United States, $132,291. So they're counting it down to the penny right there. Um, it's very interesting, especially for those who are like, oh, everyone gets away with everything. There's no more rule of law because Trump. Um, check it out, yo. We're down to calculating down to the dollar on stuff and especially looking at the COVID-19 situation emergency funds have been deployed for those who think they're going to make a quick buck they're just taking a quick trip to penitentiary and uh, that's your moment in criminal doom And now it's time for Question Time, sponsored by Game Theory Today, our little private uh, community on uh, Twitter, primosocial.com slash Game Theory Today, where, among other things, you can ask your questions and get them answered there, and also on the Game Theory Today podcast here. So Nini, who goes by at fan of Muller, so right there, right in our target demo, I've seen references to trump's tax returns as evidence of money laundering could you or lincoln's bible please explain to me exactly how that works here okay well i don't want to make any unfair accusations here based on the data uh, but i'll tell you how money laundering generally works and why looking at his tax returns might lead someone to think that that's money laundering one of the key signs there is that the guy is constantly broke that uh no matter what money goes in, it always doesn't turn a profit. Now, we call him a shitty business person, which he, he probably is as well. But being a shitty business person who's constantly going bankrupt is a certain strategy that when if your money's coming from some place where you it's dirty because it's being made by selling drugs, guns, people, something like that. That's when you need to launder it, make it clean. Now, that, that phrase originally came from the la- the coin-operated laundromats that some of the mob guys during Prohibition and after would own so they could take the cash um, from their ill-gotten gains and put it into that system where it couldn't be accounted for quite the same. And it was laundering money. You put it through a laundromat. So um, it's a metaphor, but it was literal before. Well, you can do that with real estate. You can do that with lots of different businesses. And it works best if you, you have the money come from someplace you want to obscure it. And it goes into that front business. And it pays all these contractors that are owned more or less by the same people. Um, and people get a, they, they wet their beak. They get a cut out of that. And then, up, oh, it didn't turn a profit. Or we even had a loss. And, uh, you know, we can't pay taxes on that. So you kind of get it both ways. You clean the money. And then you don't pay tax on it. Mobsters love that stuff. So if you see a business that is uh, constantly losing money, constantly refinancing its debt, and has sort of vendors that charge amounts of money that don't really make any sense, um, you might be looking at money laundering. And I think that's what she sees there. Um, Lincoln's Bible. Um so moving on here, Free Spirited One, new account there on Game Theory Today. What is your professional opinion of how this ends for Trump? Uh, this could be over by morning. Dude's sick. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, let's see. Second question. Are indictments in prison in the near future? If he's lucky, um, 
and will we have to wait until after the election before anything materializes? Uh, I would be shocked if there is a criminal indictment before the election. In fact, I think it's it's not as good as the alternative. I, I think uh, the best outcome here, and I would have preferred a different one two or three years back, I would have loved for this to be over like every sentient human being. Um, you know, I think it's best that we, the American people, vote this guy out. We've seen, we can run our own democracy. We have seen what this guy gets up to. We see what his people are like, and it's not very nice. So you know, then we make our decision. And then our, our democracy is uh, legitimate again, because we made it so. Isn't that neat? If you want a society that you run, then run it. Uh, it's kind of a, a virtuous circle, if you will. So um, I'm hoping that there's, if we're talking about waiting until after the election before anything materializes, uh, I hope, you know, either day the day after the inauguration or even the day after an election, I don't really care, hit the guy with... Um, criminal charges if, if if that's what they have they must um otherwise i don't think we'll see anything but then again it's gonna be a hell of a month Ooh, this is a cool question from one margaret x does joe biden get read in on security briefings on a daily basis how does that work uh it's probably a, a, you know a little bit different in joe's case because he has a high level clearance he has a courtesy clearance from having been a vice president um, and if you're a regular candidate, you're going to get two candidate briefings, I believe one after, uh, the convention, when you are the official candidate for the party, you get a security briefing. So, you know, not to step in certain directions with your campaign. If, uh, there are foreign adversaries who are got propaganda ready, that exact kind of thing. Um, they're not going to give you, uh, you know, tell you which U.S. senators are really uh, space aliens or anything like that. It's probably going to be a general view of the nation's security issues um, so that you can speak to those things more or less intelligently uh, and discreetly and or what's happening with your campaign. Um, and then there's one, I believe, in October, once all the ballots are printed. I'm not sure exactly the Sentinel event that they're looking for there, but my understanding is when you're a candidate, you get two national security briefings um, on that basis. This is a weird year. Uh, there's a lot going on and Joe, Joe starts with a big, uh, you know, with, with a clearance that, that, that'll get him access to lots. So is anybody telling him more? Is there anything special going on? There is no reason for me to believe that, but if they had to, you know, dude was with Obama for eight years and he's had probably security clearance for 47 or something as a Senator. So, uh, I don't know. The dude, the dude knows a lot about how the world works. So it's one of the, thing I, one of the things I think is kind of cool about him. Jill House asks a great question. What are the odds that the Senate gets flipped to the Democrats uh, coming up? A lot better than I would have guessed six months ago. Kansas is a swing state this year. Texas, within a couple points of replacing John Cornyn. Uh, that's pretty tectonic right there. Um, I, I'm not sure how Amy McGrath is doing versus Mitch McConnell. He's dug in pretty well in Kentucky there. But, um, you know, with, uh, you know, if you if you saw Jamie Harrison versus Lindsey Graham, uh, he wiped the floor with Graham. It was uh, it was really a rousing speech. And I got to say, I, I don't I'm not comfortable with partisan politics. I, I like my old stance of being nonpartisan, um, you know, and just, just being there for the decisions. This, this current cycle has not allowed that here. I'm really excited to hear speeches, uh, from political candidates on the democratic side, uh, that are just uniformly good. And Harrison's was, uh, about unity and about being South Carolinians first and then Americans. Um, and said, it's not about left or right. It's about right and wrong. Man, with that kind of message uh, reverberating here, uh, I think I think we could flip the Senate, which would make the 2021 governing and beyond, uh, you know, if we can get Mitch McConnell out of there, I think we've got a lot of opportunity. And a final question from our friend David Mark Bradley. Is the Secret Service cleared to stop Trump from launching missiles to blow us or our allies or enemies up? 
a good question and it's been asked of me uh, many times over the last four years, which will tell you where we're at. Um, but there is this metaphor that was put forth called, you know, who, who's who got their finger on the button? Who can press the button and launch nukes? Could this happen at any time? Uh, and the answer is no, a button is a uh, an actuating device uh, that many of us use on very simple pieces of equipment, i.e. less simple than an intercontinental ballistic missile that is targeted somewhere. Um, so there is no, there is no button to that. A president has a president has, I believe, uh, given to him fresh every day, uh, codes that would authenticate that this is the president, uh, communicating through the nuclear football device thingy there. Um, what he's going to do is talk to strategic command, STRATCOM, um, likely, in response to whatever he's being briefed about the situation and what to do about that situation, which they probably thought out in advance, whether there's a nuclear launch from a submarine or weapons of mass destruction tank or whatever is making us, unfortunately, want to launch nuclear weapons. We've already got a whole bunch of plans uh, that are called O plans, operational plans, that are thought out in advance and filed. And it's not just... Um, fuck it, let's bomb Slovakia. That's not how they do it. And if they did, he wouldn't be able to do that. So the Secret Service is, is the Secret Service is there uh, to, to make sure that he gets transported from place to place well and uh, that there are no surprises and that he's protected. But there is no button to stop him from pushing, so you can breathe easy. And if you would like to ask your own question so you can breathe easy, uh, check us out. Uh, it's at Game Theory Today on Twitter. And you can sign up at Primo Social. Uh, P R E M O S O C I A L dot com slash game theory today. Come join us in the lounge. And to wrap up this edition of the Game Theory Today podcast with Pam Fam positive. Active measures, remember, if Russian active measures to demoralize the population make everybody feel down, the greatest American counterweapon is positive active measures, the intentional distribution of news from all over the world that most people are actually nice and good and want to make beautiful things a reality. And I got to go with, uh, you can look on my timeline at Eric Garland or Joe Biden's timeline about just... Uh, the dogs of the campaign and about getting Major and Scout, his dogs, uh, elected uh, DOTUS, the uh, dogs of the United States. I'm not a pet person. I, you know, there's a huge thing online of them showing their cats off and showing their dogs off. And I, I love it. I mean, I, I love puppies. I love kitties as much as anybody. I'm not a pet person, though. Um, but I just thought this, you got to go watch it. It's just dogs being dogs. And, you know, when and, uh, the... All of us want to have a Drano margarita to wash down all the Haldol and sleeping pills we can get our hands on. And then the Biden campaign comes out and it's just like, hey, this guy doesn't have dogs. That's not normal. So vote for me and you get my my very nice wife and we've got two dogs. So we'll have that. And it's a small thing, but there very are there are very much no small things these days that are nice so it's not, you know you know vote for joe biden and get some dogs back in the white house i didn't think that this was going to be a big deal but it kind of is and uh just an, a real positive active measures kind of thing uh that we're okay that the species is not lost ours or theirs and <laughs> the dog species and uh we can have good things after this. And I kind of felt it was like Biden saying, look, we're looking to the future where not everything is terrible day by day, hour by hour. So I'm pretty, pretty happy with that. So thank you for being here. Thanks to all our sponsors. And to check out more of me, see my Twitter at Eric Garland, E-R-I-C-G-A-R-L-A-N-D, Garland like Judy or Christmas. And join our private community over to Game Through today. Stay frosty, peeps. And we'll catch you on the flip.